present and to those of the future. I'd also like to take this opportunity to pay my respects to any other Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people here with us today. For thousands of years, Aboriginal people have come together to meet, share, learn and learn together on this land. And as we conduct our research, may we remember that this land is, was and always will be Aboriginal land. So I'll now pass over to David. Thanks, Kez. Um, so I also would like to um, acknowledge we're on Gadigal land and um, I, I, I always think with public meetings that the you know, acknowledgement is really um, important and I think increasingly important for me as I go along, just that notion of, um, of uh, sovereignty that was never ceded over these lands. And, and, um, and I think that um, every time we have a public meeting, the opportunity to reinforce that message is, is critical. So that's uh, important for me. Uh, so welcome everyone. I'm um, David Pierce. I'm uh, the director. I had to look on the slide to check what I was. The director of <laughs> health system science um, at the George Institute, and um, also welcome to everyone online who's um, streaming. This is um, uh, an exciting kind of launch of a new initiative at the George, uh, where we've trying to establish a, um, if you like, a think tank around getting more thought leadership, debate, discussion. More, more of our research into the public arena, making it a little more tangible and, and relevant. And um, the think tank has got four key themes. Um, uh, today's is focused around health systems uh, and the other three are on women's health, um, healthy living environments and social enterprises. So what we're hoping to do um, over the course of this year is to produce more of these sorts of events along those themes and, and to encourage further discussion. Um, another key part of the think tank is we've established a distinguished fellows program uh, and this is the intention here is to bring in outside expertise um, to build our capacity within the institute um, to bring in new ideas again encouraging debate and really to to bring a, a people of excellence that can um, encourage nurture challenge some of the things we're doing at the institute so we're very excited that Trish is our inaugural Distinguished Fellow as a part of this program. Um, so Trish Greenhalgh needs no introduction, I'm pretty sure, to, to most of you. And um, if you have been following her hashtag Trish on tour, you'll see um, she does have um, a, a bit of rock star status in the in the in the world, and um, and you can just see what some of the people have posted on. Um, hashtag Trish on tour to, to get a feel for that. Um, so I, I, she's Professor of Primary Care Health Sciences at the University of Oxford, um, has a long career in, in particularly looking at the space around healthcare and service delivery and organisation and, and understanding um, what's going on in that space. And, and um, as you will all know, many seminal papers that have been published along the way in that career. Um, I thought I'd reflect on maybe three things that um, have inspired me about Trisha's work. Um, and, and the first is that Trish is a GP. Um, and I think um, I happen to be a GP myself. And um, the, this notion of being a generalist is something I've found very um, important in my career, that, um, that uh, having this kind of overview of, of um, what are often murky spaces and, and contested complex spaces in the healthcare arena and what a generalist can bring, that lens can be different to what, um, what special um, specialty lenses can bring to that. And I don't just mean medical specialists, but any kind of specialist discipline. Um, so I found that um, really instructive in, in, in my work. Um, the second is, um, some of you might have seen one of Trisha's papers about um, what can um, dead white male philosophers bring to um, understanding healthcare, um, and and it's really kind of uh, as a um, alive brown male um, <laughs> GP, um, it's encouraged me to think about different um, different knowledges and bringing in different ideas into understanding healthcare um, dilemmas and and thinking more broadly and. And bringing, um, as she does very strongly, the the, the um, humanist element and social sciences element into this realm is 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 uh, been very instructive. 
Um, and the third is around the, the, that you can't, you know, we can't do this alone. Interdisciplinary work is, is critical to this. And um, if many, any of you kind of delve into the methods section of a lot of Trisha's papers, you'll see what a kind of complex piece of work, bringing in a lot of disparate um, data sources, um, people from dis different disciplines. Um, this isn't lightweight analysis. It's quite complex pieces of work. And, and, um, and I think bringing that together, and you'll probably see that in her talk today, um, bringing that together to something coherent that's interesting, that contributes new knowledge is, is um, I think, something we at the Georgia are wanting to invest a lot more effort in. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Trish to uh, give us her lecture. I don't need oh. for that, that uh, great introduction. <laughs> um, I, firstly, I, I feel so, so privileged to, to have been welcomed into the George Institute as a distinguished fellow. In fact, as your first distinguished fellow. So I'm hoping to be able to distinguish myself a little bit today. And, and to that end, I wore my best Trish on Tour t-shirt, which was given to me back in Melbourne um, a couple of weeks ago now on, on my very first gig in my tour around Australia. I mean, you don't come to Australia just to give one talk. So I lined a few up and, you know, meeting all my friends. And they presented me with this, this Trish on Tour t-shirt because we've been joking about that. So that's why I'm wearing it. Um, I hope you don't mind. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking about stories, really. You know, you can argue about whether a narrative is a story or whether it's a little kind, particular kind of a story. Let's just call it stories, right? And I want to Think about how analysing stories can help us enrich this research that many of us do into behavioural change. I've called it the ontological desert. In other words, look, it's not, it's not rich enough. It's a bit stimulus response. Um, so let's, let's take, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about some empirical work that my team did. Um, and then there'll, there'll, there'll be lots of discussion. I hope you'll chip in. Um, we were funded by the European Union, European Commission um, Framework 7 program, and also I'm a National Institute for Health Research Senior Investigator, and there's lots of people on the GIFTS team who've contributed to this research. So it's not just my research, it's, a, it's quite a big program of work, or at least GIFTS was a big program of work. The storytelling uh, was a tiny bit of a very large program of work, I'll tell you about that. All right. So... I've told you that a narrative is a story, but what is a story? What is a story? I mean, we, that's what distinguishes us from, from the animals, right? We are a storytelling species. From mother's knee, father's knee, mustn't be sexist about this. You know, the first thing you do with your kid, you start telling them stories. Um, so what is a story? Well, if you go back to Aristotle, who was probably one of the first scholars to, to, to theorize narrative, and he said, well, there's a number of things about stories. First of all, there's a time dimension. It's unfolding over time, actions and events unfolding over time. There's a setting, a stage. Very often the story is a drama. There's characters, people who get in and out of trouble, heroes, villains, bystanders, people who fail to act or people who act, you know, that kind of thing. Always in a story, there is trouble, trouble, uh, what Aristotle called peripeteia, uh, a breach from the expected. Jerome Brunner said um, all stories involve this mismatch between the canonical and the unexpected, the surprise, the twist in the plot. And plot is the use of literary devices. I've called it, you know, given you examples of repetition, metaphor, suspense, surprise, that kind of thing, tropes, to depict a kind of causality, narrative causality. This happened because of that. But you often don't use the word because, you just juxtapose the words and the sentences and the imagery to imply a kind of causality. So you can imagine that the study of stories isn't exactly a science. But therein lies some challenges. Um, now, Jerome Brunner, who's only recently died at the age of 100, 101, um, 
I, I've got so much respect for Jerome Brunner. Absolutely amazing guy, psychologist, trained with Piaget, actually. And, and, and he was only teaching, you know, two years ago, he was still teaching psychology. Um, he took psychology away from stimulus response and into the study of meaning. And he, he wrote this book, um, Acts of Meaning. It's a very thin book. You can buy it off Amazon for about $10. It, it's worth getting. It's really, really easy to read. And what he says is that all experience is narratively structured. We live our lives in narrative. Um, narrative is evidence. Narrative seeks to persuade. When I tell you a story, I tell it in a particular way in order to persuade you of a perspective. So narrative is always perspectival, biased, if you want to be epidemiological. Um, OK. Not all evidence is narrative. What do I mean by that? OK, there's a famous case in um, a legal case in the UK. And it goes like this. There was a guy who um, had a wife. He didn't particularly like his wife. Um, she went off to buy turnips. She came back, got in the bath and drowned. And he said, well, she had a fit in the bath. Um, terrible, because she'd only just bought the turnips for supper. So he, uh, there was something about turnips in the legal case. So he got married to someone else after a few years. Off she went to buy turnips from the market, came back, had a bath, um, and drowned. And he said, oh, it's a terrible thing. She had an epileptic fit or something, and she drowned in the bath. Um, a couple of years later, he got married again. And a few years after that, off the wife went to buy turnips and came back and, and um, had a, a, a nasty mishap and drowned in the bath. Now, the legal case rested on the fact that one of those narratives might be a dreadful tragedy, but three in a row, um, <laughs> that was fishy. <laughs> and he got done for murdering all three. Whereas actually, when at the beginning, the point was nobody suspected him. But hang on. Now, the reason why I, I'm giving you that is that although everything is narratively structured, there is also a place for quantitative evidence in weighing up. It's slightly tangential to what we, um, uh, what this is about, but I thought I'd throw it in. Okay, so in what circumstances, if at all, is the collection of narrative stories research? Where's the rigor? Can there be rigor when the story is, as I've said, irredeemably perspectival? It really is just me trying to persuade you of something. Um, so we did a study a few years ago. Um, this began, I guess Twitter hadn't been invented then, but there were all these kind of email lists that academics were involved in. Um, and Tom Wengraff and I, Tom Wengraff uh, studies narrative, so do I. We put together a Delphi panel, which was done by email, um, to try and get some kind of quality standards for narrative research. This was published in Medical Education back in 2008. So, after about a year and a half of going back around and around all these different academics and non-academics around narrative, we decided that this was what uh, research was going to be defined as, purposive systematic inquiry that aims to contribute new knowledge. Um, narrative, I've told you what narrative is. The aim of narrative research, very importantly, is not necessarily to determine the truth, universal, predictive, but to explore how individuals make sense of events, um, explore attitudes, explore meanings. Uh, and I'm going to come back to meaning. We don't think about meaning enough. And in order to improve our analysis of meaning, stories are a very good way in. OK? Um, narrative research can include a lot of things. It can include gathering stories. It can include. Um, so for gathering stories, I mean, collecting stories that are already around. I'm doing something at the moment around complaint letters, actually. Uh, so people write in, you know, to the chief executive, I didn't like the way I was treated. There's a story. Um, and then there's eliciting stories. You know, you go out and do an, a narrative interview, um, interpreting existing stories. There's lots of stuff on the web these days. Collating stories, bringing, you know, all that secondary work around stories. Um, now, of course, if the story already exists and you are doing research on it, that wasn't the purpose for which it was told. So there's all sorts of interesting ethical issues which we go out, go um, into in this paper. Um, there are some general criteria of high quality research, um, which I'm sure you 
kind of get your head around. You can imagine that, that this is, it's not, you don't need the same kind of sample size as you might for an epidemiological study, but you still need to justify how many stories you collected and from whom, that kind of thing. You need to be rigorous in your data collection. You need to make sure you're not deceiving people who are telling the story. You need to make sure the story is told in, in an appropriate context, all that kind of thing. And the last one of these, I think, is very important. It comes from Anne Oakley. Uh, I love this quote, that the, 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 the distinguishing feature of any research is the awareness of the possibility of error and the measures the researcher takes to take account of that error and um, not necessarily control for it, but just, just interpret findings in the light of error. Um, and then there are all sorts of ethical duties that we have towards the person who's telling the story, because very often the stories we're collecting are stories of people who are disempowered. Um, that's why we're, we're doing research into, into particular groups, and that will come up in the stories that I'm going to share with you. Um, so, so lots of ethical issues, which I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on, but they are pretty, pretty important. Uh, they're in the paper. OK, so the GIFTS Research Program was funded 3 million euros. We got 45,000 of those. So we got a tiny droplet of this big grant, which was all about, actually, the um, intergenerational cycle of deprivation and the development of obesity related problems in South Asians. Um, in the East End of London, we have a very high proportion of people of South Asian and actually uh, Sub-Saharan African ethnicity. The prevalence of type 2 diabetes is massive. We've got the highest prevalence of type 2 diabetes um, in teenagers, in school children, type 2 diabetes, um, certainly in Britain, and I'm pretty sure in Europe. Um, the antenatal clinic in the local hospital, something like 55-0% of all the women have gestational diabetes or pre-existing diabetes. So this is not a tiny proportion of the women, the pregnant women. Diabetes in pregnancy is massive. And pregnancy outcomes, despite very good services, pregnancy outcomes are not good because of um, problems with health literacy, system literacy, uh, people not coming for care, not presenting till they're 18 weeks pregnant, that kind of thing. Um, OK, so in order to look at um, this whole issue, this was very much framed as epigenetics epigenetics. Um, there was going to be some randomized controlled trials. Um, this was going to be in collaboration with India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Norway for some reason. Don't ask me why. So we were work package nine in this massive study. Okay, this isn't my paper. This is somebody else's paper. And I've given their definition of epigenetics there, study of changes in organisms caused by modification of gene expression rather than alteration of the genetic code itself. So the idea is that overnutrition, that is eating too much, under-exercising in women who've got diabetes in pregnancy, either gestational or pre-existing type 2, leads to a kind of metabolic programming of the mother, which increases the risk, her risk of subsequently de developing type 2, um, if she hasn't got it already, and metabolic programming of the fetus, which increases the risk of type 2 diabetes in the next generation. And that is why we are seeing in the East End of London, younger and younger people developing type 2. Um, so obesity in sort of 10, 11, 12 year olds is a big problem. Um, now, these people suggested improvements in maternal public health programs in pre-transition and post-transition population. Transition meaning moving from, uh, you know, sort of um, traditional, relatively poor, rural um, type um, existence to urbanized, westernized type thing. And the transition zone, as you probably know, is, is an area of um, very high prevalence of these uh, diseases of westernization, for particularly diabetes. So the idea was, look what they say. So this is in the Lancet around epigenetics, provision of education to relevant groups about the risks of rapidly adopting Western lifestyles could be considered. So they know a heck of a lot about genetics, but they know very much about changing behavior. So here's the model that they're looking at. 
you, the, per, the, the person, the target person is an empty bucket. And into that bucket, you put the education and then there's going to be behavior change. Um, it is pedagogically and culturally naive. I, I mean, I love epigeneticists because they get big grants and I get bits of it, but this is problematic. <laughs> They actually don't work in an interdisciplinary way normally. And so they have this very naive model of learning and change. OK, so this was the paper we published. The funny thing is, it's now several years later. There's almost no papers published from this gift study of epigenetics, except this one. This was published in 2015. Um, and this is very interdisciplinary. Um, we've got we've got various people here, but but you know we've got nurses, we've got anthropologists, we've got we've got geneticists, we've got clinicians, um, we've got me, I'm GP, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so so I want to tell you about this paper. Um, we use this model. I don't did you know this paper by Glass and McCatty? It's just a fabulous paper from social science and medicine, um, behavioral science at the crossroads. And it begins with the word enough with an exclamation mark. We've got to do things differently. So read the paper. It's, it, it, this is their inspiration. And I'm going to talk you through this rather complicated um, model. It's not really that complicated. Oh, look, there we go. That is when you're born. And along here is a time axis, and that's when you die. Um, or you haven't quite died, but I don't think you die on the, on the picture, but you know. <laughs> and then down here is everything very small, like um, molecules and genes and cells and organs. And then here, where it crosses, that's you as an individual, the, the human. That's your human behavior. And then above here is your family, your school or workplace. I don't know, the wider society and then and some global thing here, like global warming, I don't know. So, so you've got the size of stuff and then you've got time axis. And here you've got human action. Now that is influenced by all these micro things like your genes feeding up. And it's also influenced, of course, by these meso and macro and mezzo, mezzo level. Um, and the idea is that we embody all these sort of cultural influences, but we also have this sort of physiological and biochemical influences. OK, so I liked that because you can put you can fit almost everything any one of us does somewhere on that picture. Um, but but actually, I think this axis of nested hierarchies is what the the epigeneticists need to get the head around. OK, so what were we doing? We were trying to understand the many influences on behavior of a South Asian mother, and that's we, we, we've got many different South Asian ethnicities. So in this study, we, we looked at um, people from, I think, five different religions speaking half a dozen different languages and all the rest of it. Um, uh, so we wanted to understand what was influencing behavior. We wanted to theorize how those influences interacted and built over time. And we wanted to inform the design of interventions that were actually going to have an impact on this massive problem of not just gestational diabetes, but the type 2 diabetes in, in uh, the South Asian community. So we ended up, uh, the, the final sample was 45 South Asian women who were either pregnant or had recently been pregnant. And with many, though not all, of the South Asian groups in the East End, they're still having sort of, you know, five, six, seven, eight children. So they're either currently pregnant or they're about to become pregnant. You know, it's the, the, so the idea that you could sample people who were not pregnant, that was never going to work because they, they might not even know they were pregnant. So we just said, oh, I'll just have it, you know, don't. but you've either, you're either pregnant or you've been pregnant um, recently, I think within a year. And then we started off giving them, uh, putting them in story sharing groups. Come and join a group in your own language. Some, some spoke English, so others preferred to speak in other languages. Um, there's, there's lots and lots of bilingual researchers. It's not a problem if people want to speak, um, you know, Sileti. You just get Sileti PhD students to run them, um, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but actually, only about half of them were recruited through the groups because we found Rather to our surprise, we've been running groups for middle-aged um, South Asians for a long time. Um, young women didn't want to come to the groups. And so we visited them in their homes, which was very interesting because then we got to see what their homes were like, which wasn't in the original design. Interviewed in their own language, and it was a conversational approach. Tell me the story. And the prompts were narrative prompts. In other words, you are guided by your own curiosity. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me a bit more what happened next, that kind of thing. We audio tape and then we have this simultaneous translation and transcription. So if, it, if you're hearing it in 
in say Saleti, which is actually a language you can't write down because it's got no written form, you translate it as you transcribe and then you get somebody else to come and listen to the tape and mark where they disagree with you. And um, we've used that, you know, for a long time. All right, so we analyze the narrative data immerse yourself in the text, read the stories. We had hundreds of stories, little story fragments. Just read them and read them and read them and talk about them. Describe what's going on, theorize, bring in all this nested hierarchy stuff, illustrate, um, write another story that draws on all the things, the narrative themes that you brought out, uh, something called, um, they called it critical fiction, where we're fictionalizing, and I'll show you an example of one of those, and then validation, feeding it back to people from different ethnic groups saying, does this ring true? Is this the kind of story that represents what you and people like you are going through? Um, we started it all off on an Excel spreadsheet and it was one of those, what I call the VLDRT approach to qualitative data analysis, very large dining room table. So it, I, don't, I don't like software. I, I use it sometimes, but it, the, this didn't really lend itself to software, uh, mainly because the stories are so fragmented. Um, okay, so what were the stories about? Well, guess what? You had a load of women, some of whom were pregnant, some of whom recently had kids, and I've had kids. What do you talk about? You talk about, oh, God, when I was pregnant, um, this is what happened. Uh, so lots of what we call short-term stories, and there were three narrative, big kind of narrative themes here. The first was, if women were diabetic during pregnancy, they experienced it as highly stressful and out of control. Now, my background, I trained as a diabetologist and my doctorate, funnily enough, was in insulin kinetics. And I used to have to run the adolescent diabetic clinic uh, and the pregnancy diabetic clinic. And the problem is that actually it's quite a metab metabolically volatile state. It's not very easy. Uh, and people who've been pregnant and they're on insulin will say, well, when I, when I, when after the baby's born, my diabetic control go is better. So, so, you know, they're not making this up. It, it is stressful to maintain diabetic control. Um, the impact of behavior on symptoms. So there were two things we wanted women to do is take more exercise and eat less. Uh, that's basically it. Um, and what we had again and again and again with the stories of how I tried to take exercise and it made me collapse. It made my legs hurt. It made me swell up. Uh, lots of stories about that and counter narratives from other members of the group saying, yeah, that happened to me. Um, and the other one was, I, I need to eat. I need to eat more. So those of you who do women's health and pregnancy, you, you know, you this myth that you have to eat for two when you're pregnant, you really don't because you're usually doing less exercise, you're less active because you've got this thing sticking out. Um, and so actually just maintaining a normal eating, and that's what I advise people as a GP, actually these South Asian women were saying, no, 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 I must eat, I must double the amount of rice I eat. And it was very often the carbohydrate that they were saying, I must, and I, that makes me feel better. Um, and lots of accounts of advice. And of course, this is very gendered. It's my sisters, my mother-in-law, whatever, other women who are giving this advice. Um, here's an example. I love this quote. And this was, this was I think, in English. She, she was speaking in English. So it's, we use this directly. A lot of people advise me to eat this or that, that for your diabetes. So I followed their orders. Get the narrative causality rather than just the doctors. We've got a value hierarchy here. You know, who's the most important person that's being listened? I followed their orders rather than just the doctors. Interesting. There were also medium term stories about family life, about community life, and about what happened the last time they went to the doctor, particularly the GP. The, 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 the general practice provision in this part of London is very variable. There's some excellent ones and some not so good ones. Um, so the domestic life, um, women were tied to the kitchen. You know, I, 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 a woman's work has never done that. That's in inverted commas. Nobody said that. It's sort of thing my mother used to say back in the 1960s. Um, there's always guests. There's always someone to cook for. There's always something to do. You can't get out of the kitchen. Um, stories of progressive weight gain. I gained weight, but then that was to be expected because you know my mother and sister gained weight type thing. It was it was absolutely normalised. Um, that nothing, it wasn't, oh my goodness, what a terrible thing, I gained however many pounds. It was just, that was what happened. And 
past experiences of I was just told by the doctor I really didn't need to go it was wasted my time and I've been into these GP surgeries and on the wall in several Asian languages are, are the instructions one appointment one problem so if you've got a problem with your diabetes and tingling in your feet they think of that as two problems and you're not allowed to mention the tingling in your feet get that so that was the context that was feeding into those stories. Rather unsurprising that, that people tended to present late with their pregnancy. Here's a quote. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what language that was translated from, but, but it was the, the waste bin. And those of you, I mean, I remember when my kids were tiny, I remember when you just sort of finish up cold fish fingers because you don't want to waste them and you just fed the kids, you know, that kind of thing. Of course, if you have several children um, and you've got to eat the, um, the slightly ritualistic evening meal with the mother-in-law afterwards as well uh, as, as that. So, so this was, you know, you could understand it once you got into the story. And then there were long-term stories about the distant past. Um, particularly about genetic heritage in our family. Well, granddad had diabetes and so on had diabetes and cultural heritage. Um, the idea that um, the individual um, is, is just less significant than, significant than the family and the community. I'll, I'll give you some examples in a minute. And then there was material heritage. A lot of people had a story within living memory of not quite someone who died of starvation, but when things were really tough. And those of you who study food insecurity will know that that has an enormously powerful influence on people's current eating behavior. Um, stuff about back home. So the person who said this had never been back home, but back home is where your family had come from just one generation ago. And we never got diabetes then. So that was the story of the cultural and, and genetic heritage. So I made this diagram. Um, you, what you've got over to the left is the ancestral past a long time ago. And then you've got the distant past, recent past, so that's maybe last year. And then you've got the present and the stories the, the short term stories are sort of nested within the medium term stories, nested within the longer term stories about cultural heritage. They're all mixed up. They don't say, right, I'm telling you a story about what happened last week now. And then in the next paragraph, I'll give you what happened in Bangladesh in the 1970s. It doesn't work like that. OK. So, so I made that diagram for the paper. It doesn't tell you, I think, anything more than I've already said, but uh, so let me give you a, a fictionalized narrative. Um, this is, Fatima isn't a real person, but we pulled her together. Um, she's, we made her 31, she came to the UK from Bangladesh at the age of 16, married at 17, and has so far had five children, one of whom uh, was still born at 36 weeks, a common complication of poorly controlled diabetes, or, or you know, it's certainly what I described. And we had a couple of examples in our 45 mums of stillbirths. Um, all her children were heavy. Three, three and a half kilograms is really big for a Bangladeshi baby. Um, and this story of, of, of medicalized births because the kiddies are, are, are big, you know, and they end up on, on uh, special care. So, you know, big ones, they're, they're, they're quite sick, even though they are big. Um, the eldest daughter is already being teased at school for being overweight. Um, the... Fatima says she didn't have diabetes with the first three pregnancies, but actually she doesn't really know whether she was tested. And that was a common thing that came up again. So she diagnosed with gestational diabetes at 24 weeks. That's a bit too late to diagnose it, but whatever, that's probably when she presented. Um, and that terrified her. She was now frightened that the unborn baby would die. Uh, and in fact, there are stories in the East End, so don't, whatever you do, go to the doctor because they'll put you on insulin and the baby will die, which is a bit of a shame. Um, so she was told to cut down her rice, all that kind of thing. She tried hard, but the diet made her feel so terrible. And then the, the women came in and told her she's got to take sufficient rice to maintain her strength and nourish the baby. So, that, so the female relatives are saying, no, 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 you're really starving your baby to death if you don't take more rice. Um, Last two pregnancies, she monitors herself. Um, she's busy. She's got these young kids to do. And she, you know, they're very nice at the clinic, but it's very difficult to get there. So maybe she doesn't go as often as she 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 um, is um, advised to. Um, she doesn't like the insulin. 
that this is a sudden thing. You know, when you're you're not diabetic, then halfway through your pregnancy, you suddenly have to deal with this needle that you've never dealt with before. It's scary um, because you're worried about your baby. But actually, Fatima's father has been on insulin for ages, and he helps her with this, and she finds this reassuring. And so we have, you know, the, the, the extended family pull round. Um, but actually, the dad's not pregnant. He's pretty well controlled, and she doesn't feel that it's that he's going through the same thing. Um, and she doesn't feel it's fair that everyone says, "Well, come on, your dad can manage it." But she's chasing around with all these kids. Okay, she's not well. She's got she's swelling up. Um, she's got lots of domestic duties, uh, very physically demanding, and she's doing the Muslim prayer rituals, which are quite physical. You know, you're up and down, up and down, up and down. In fact, the, the, the word in Saleti for prayer is namaz, which sometimes translates as exercise. So um, we had this a few years ago where um, we were saying to, you're not taking enough exercise. And it was being translated as you're not saying your prayers enough, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so there's a, it's a little bit... Um, the idea because the word is the same the 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 this prayer ritual is seen as exercise and taking the kids to school and all the rest of it actually the amount of calories burned is probably fairly minimal but fatima believes she's taking a lot of exercise um and she's getting more and more tired um and so she um she tries to rest up she spends a lot of time in bed um and she doesn't feel safe exercising neither would i in the east end of london so in each of the pregnancies, she's putting on weight. She thinks it's due to fluid, bit surprised that she doesn't lose much of it after the baby's born, picking at the food. But, you know, the female relatives went through the same thing. Then she has the blood test six weeks after the baby's born. Oh, it's gone away again. So she's completely it's now gone, finished. And she's very surprised. Only a few months later to be told that she got type 2 diabetes. She had no idea that this was a possibility can't understand it, never took sugar in her tea, which is somehow the folk myth that, you know, that's what causes diabetes. Um, and now she's on to the advice from the GP and she's, you know, still quite confused. All right. But actually, she doesn't have a lot of time to attend to her own health, you know, with all these kids. OK. We have put this back into the glass and McCatty nested hierarchy. Um, I do need this thing here. What we've got here, oh, no, can't do that. Let's ignore the, um, let's ignore the pointer. Um, so now what you've got down at where the two black lines cross is this birth weight and early exposures. So let's have Ratna, the, the daughter, has, uh, was already a big baby. She's had early exposures. She's already a bit obese. And then when she gets pregnant in a few years' time, um, she's going to have an imbalance in between her in energy input and her energy expenditure. During pregnancy, she is highly likely to gain weight and also to experience loss of fitness, deconditioning. Um, that will be her baseline for her next pregnancy. But look at this. We have intrauterine hyperglycemia leading to fetal programming leading here to a baby whose birth weight and whose micro environment for all that genetic stuff is adverse. Um, you can see all the different influences at all the different levels. You've got genetic predisposition, which is very strong in some South Asian communities. Um, and then you've also got physiological status, bodily sensations, hunger. Why, you know, how come women are so hungry all the time? People haven't looked at that enough. I mean, they eat because they're hungry. Um, and then there's stuff around personality traits, um, you know, the sort of um, more, the more behaviorist stuff, you know, self-efficacy and stuff like that, which we need, we do need to work on. Those are not wrong, but we need to take a look at the whole thing. And then you can see all this stuff at the top. Um, the built environment, the walkability of the built of the environment. You can't walk anywhere in the east end of London. Um, not if you're a young woman anyway, you know, all that kind of thing. Okay. So let me conclude. Glass and McCatty have this great statement. Human behavior is sandwiched inextricably between ecology and biology, the, the, the macro stuff and the micro stuff. I love that. But the rising prevalence of diabetes in South Asians, in, in, certainly in London, is mediated by patterns of behavior in pregnant women, 
what they eat, how much exercise they take, that are poorly matched to their metabolic needs. Narrative research can start to unpack the multiple interacting influences on maternal behavior. And through that narrative form, we can synthesize all those different uh, influences. Now, here's a conclusion that the anthropologist on my team uh, penned. Uh, I really like this one. Pregnancy-related behaviors, which are very much prompted by the peer group, the fellow women in this case, they have three features. The first one is that they are intimate. They are deeply personal. The second is that they are familiar. They're grounded in the richness of family relationships and traditions. And the third thing is that they are morally resonant. They are viewed as the right thing to do. They're, you know, This is a moral thing, not just a behavioral thing. So education is bound to be ineffective. Just pure education, as, as the, those epigeneticists recommend, it's got to be. We have to make advice more culturally meaningful and more morally resonant. So we need more imaginative interventions, which have got to be co-designed by families and communities to meet these criteria. And we've been doing some interesting work to, to co-design interventions, but... Uh, the, the, this fourth conclusion, it, intimate, familiar, and morally resonant. If it's not that, if your intervention is not those three things, my prediction is it ain't going to work. All right. That's the end of my talk. So. Fantastic. Um, so we're on, uh, anyone uh, streaming in, we're on... Um, Hashtag George Talks or hashtag Trish on Tour. Any of those will do if you want to tweet a question. Um, but in the meantime, we'll take questions from the uh, live audience here. Steve. Thanks for the talk. Um, I uh, just want to ask a question about your use of a theoretical framework at the start. Um, and uh, I was wondering whether you could maybe um, elaborate on the rationale for doing that, because it, it, to a non-expert in this area, what it seems to do is it, it almost prescribes what you can find in your, um, in your data. And is there a danger with a theoretical framework that you perhaps miss things that um, may have uh, unexpectedly come up? Um, uh, well, I think... It's a great and interesting question. Is it, Do you begin a qualitative study with no theoretical framework and allow the data to speak for themselves, or do you start with a theory and that will make some data kind of visible and others backgrounded? I'm not a great lover of, of what they call grounded theory. I do like to begin with a um, some kind of theoretical lens. Um, and the reason is I've read so many studies that have used grounded theory and have found things that are they're not very rich. Um, so yeah, in a way, what you're saying is this is a tautology. You began with this model that said there's going to be genetic influences and cellular influences and physiological influences, and there's going to be all these macro influences, and then that's what you found. Yeah. Um, <laughs> guilt is charged. But on the other hand, I think at a, at a general level, um, you know, something like life course epidemiology is predicated on those, those assumptions. Um, and that's a tradition, a research tradition that's gone back many decades. And so I would say that all Glass and Cati are doing is to say, here is a rather elegant model, I think, that, that, that allows you to operationalize the idea of life course epidemiology. Um, Beyond that, you can you can bring in other theories. So, for example, I could bring in psychoanalysis into it if I wanted to. You know what I mean? It's, it's quite a kind of broad brush. I can say that within that psychological level, it's all to do with the relationship with the father. And then we still, I mean, I didn't believe that, but, 
it, the, in other words, it allows you to incorporate a very wide range of, of potential sociological, psychological, and indeed um, biochemical theories within that. So, so I mean, what do they call it? It's um, the grand theory, maybe. Sure. So you can bring in other. Is that? Yeah, yeah. Just a quick follow-up point. Then, given that importance of theory, how do you decide what's a good theory and what's a bad theory? And how does? Good yeah. question. Um, I would say. Good theories stand the test of time. Um, good theories help you explain most of your data. I remember a few years ago, we looked at, we're actually looking at interpreting services. Um, so it's a completely different study. And we started off with one theory. And we coded using uh, software, actually, all the data that could fit this theory. And we thought, we've still got two thirds of the data that we haven't coded. That took us back to the theoretical literature saying, we need another theory. Uh, and actually, that's when I discovered theories around organizational routines, that, that interpreting in primary care was mainly about the organization and delivery of care. Uh, and, and so we brought those in. And we wrote another three papers based on, on a different set of theories. So I would say um, a good theory will allow you to code most of your data or, you know what I mean? Um, and then I think there is something about plausibility and resonance. Um, you know, I, I go hot and cold on realist theories, you know, that context mechanism outcome stuff. And sometimes I think you're just kind of, um, just retrofitting your data to this incredibly complicated theory. You think, well, do, we, do we need it? And I, I'm moving away from that now. I mean, this theory actually helped us. It, it allowed us to um, make sense of our data. So, yeah. But it's a subject of judgment in the end, isn't it? Hello. Um, I'm Yun Hee John from the University of Sydney. Thank you. Um, may I just comment on what just been discussed, who used to be a grounded theorist? And um, and I think there are really some good grounded theory papers published, but a lot of them are not actually grounded theories. Um, yeah, but I think I think it depends on what your research question is. And I've done both, you know, yeah. trying to develop substantive theory that really explains and tells us what it is in detail. Um, but also, you know, um, for example, using um, Roger's adaptation theory to explain how people actually use um, electronic online support program to manage their arthritis. Okay. So there are pros and cons, and I think it very much depends on what your research question is. Yeah. Can you, okay, give us an example of a piece of work where grounded theory helped. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I can talk about the, the kind of work the community nurses do. So I'm a registered nurse, and um, this is based on my PhD work you know, more than 15 years ago. And um, I wanted to explore the interactions the nurses have with their family carers or people with severe mental illness. Okay. So it is not about just describing what's happening. It is actually about understanding how so it's how the nurse is working with the patient, but also engaging families in the process. So often we just think that nurses support families, but the family's perspective is not necessarily that they are involved in the part of the care. So when we do grounded theory, you get to actually observe what's happening between them. You're not just hearing what one party says what's happening. So in doing that, you kind of compare different perspectives and then understand what are the conditions, context, and also the processes along the way. So if yeah. you just... That's a great example of grounded theory. And I, yeah. I agree with you. When it's done well, and when it's done in an area where there isn't much theory, I mean, presumably all theories came from, you know, up from the ground up in, in, initially. Um, and that's a great example of where you were sort of treading new territory. Whereas I think in, in, in the one I presented, there's already lots of good theories. Um, 
and actually we drew on this one because it explained the data we could have i think phd students often use grounded theory because they i mean they've got three years to slog away the data <laughs> <laughs> <Five months. Yeah. laughs> whatever Thank you. Anne Dadditch from Western Sydney University. Thank you. Yeah. How are you? Oh, and so a, a very thought-provoking presentation. Thank you very much. I asked this question partly as a devil's advocate, but I'm wondering whether a narrative approach helps to un uncomplexify complexity, whether there's a forced linearity about um, a very messy experience. Yeah. I'm wondering if you had any thoughts about that. Well, I think, I don't know what, I think it probably does on uncomplexify, decomplexify complexity. In, in a way, um, I'm trying to remember who it is that says this. It's one of the great writers on narrative who says that narrative is the most efficient way of pulling a thread through a complex phenomenon. Um, it just pulls out the things that are relevant and salient. As long as you do it right, which is what we wrote the paper on. Hang on a minute. What, what do you mean by doing it right? Um, but it's quite interesting when you, if you have a patient who's admitted to hospital, you have a checklist of everything. You, you end up writing about 10 pages of notes. If you take a history, a really kind of experienced clinician taking a narrative history, it's probably be half a page and you've got all the stuff. Um, which is quite amazing when you think, you, we always think of narrative as meandering and inefficient, but I think you're right, it's not. And uh, that's certainly what we found. We found these tiny little narrative fragments, two sentences long, were a window to a universe of, of, of kind of cultural influences very efficiently. Um, Maybe a related question to that is how did you handle the, the sort of reflexivity in this and the, the resisting the, the, the possibility of forcing a particular narrative? Yeah, I mean, one of the things was we had a few people looking at different bits of the data set, not least because different people spoke different languages. Um, so that was one thing. Um, we talked a lot about the data. We, we, you know, we, everyone shares an office and we say, oh, we've just done a group and guess what's coming up and can't wait to get the transcript. And then you read through the translated transcript. We said, oh, they come up in our, in our group as well. And so there was a lot of conversations had about the conversations. Um, and the other thing was that there was a bit of an autoethnographic bit to it when we went out and started interviewing people who said they didn't have time or their husbands wouldn't let them come to the group. We visited them at home. We would then bring in um, the autoethnographic data of even though there I was interviewing this woman, she still kept getting sent out to make tea for all the men type thing. Um, now, there is an authenticity in bringing that, you know, there is a reflexivity involved in the autoethnographic stuff. And so what we were finding was different bits of the project um, were resonating with each other and things were coming up in both in the individual interviews, in the uh, groups, even though some of the women were Muslims, you know, from Bangladesh, some of them were, some of them were Christian, you know, Sri Lankan women, some of them were Sikh. And you think, gosh, the commonalities across these narratives are massively more interesting than the differences between them. Um, for example, the types of food people ate. I mean, the plain fact was they were all picking all the time. Um, so I guess that's how we avoided. And also we went back. We did what, what they call member checking. We went back to the groups. That wasn't very easy because um, it's, it's not that hard. You, you, know, you ring someone up and say, do you remember a year ago someone came and interviewed you? Can I come and tell you a new story to see if it resonates? And they just say, well, no, I'm not interested. <laughs> <laughs> so actually getting people to agree to do the member checking was a little bit difficult. And I think probably it was the low hanging fruit. It was the better educated of the groups that we got. But, you know, that is always the case, I think. Um, so, yeah, it wasn't a perfect piece of research by any means. Um, but the thing that we liked about it was um, when we did run the story by particularly the Bangladeshi groups, because we, we made it a Bangladeshi um, character, 
they said, yeah. And they, they engaged so well with this woman. They, they couldn't quite believe that she didn't exist. And so they said, where does she live? We'll go and visit her. We'll help her. She must need help with those little children. And then there's this fiction now, isn't it? That's what we said. So, and then we thought, if, she, if she's real to them, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and we're working with a lot of bilingual health advocates. Two of the people on the um, group are what we call bilingual health advocates who also get an interest in research, doing master's degrees. And they, they are very much cultural brokers for the community. So we, were, we, you know, we, we, we had a very good relationship and a long-standing relationship with the, with the South Asian community in, in London. I mean, some of the groups were held in the mosque, you know, that kind of thing. Thanks for a really fascinating presentation. I'm a PhD student at Sydney Uni um, in public health, um, and I'm doing a narrative analysis of some work at the moment of focus groups I did. Um, so it's been really useful to hear how you've you've done this work. Um, I suppose my question was, you said at the beginning that this was a small part of a much larger grant. How have the findings from this work been used to um, been used to inform the broader um, research project um, and if it hasn't been taken on as much as you would have liked why might that be the I, case? I think the reason why this is so often the case when you apply for a, a grant to do a multi-component study is that you have a grant that's going to last you know, four years or whatever it might be. And of course, the qualitative data is supposed to inform the RCT, which is supposed to inform. No, it never works like that because guess what? They've got to start planning the RCT, getting the ethics in before you've analysed your blooming data. So although some of our emerging findings certainly influence the uh, interventions that were used in RCTs, uh, and, you know, not just in London, but also in uh, South Asian countries. Um, actually, most of this, because of the time frame of it, ended up in influencing other interventions in other RCTs. Does that make sense? Um, it did influence. I think. I think one of the things that it. One of the ways it influenced both the clinical trialists and the epigeneticists was it made them think more deeply about not oversimplifying the, you know, like that thing at the beginning when I said they just think, oh, we just educate people. Um, they don't think like that anymore. Um, and now the next grant that they're applying for, uh, Megan Clinch, who's my anthropologist or the anthropologist I was working with, she's kind of a, an equal member of the team now. Um, and she's getting, she's influencing the way they're writing the grant applications, which I think is, is slightly tangential, but I think that's actually quite important. I think the fact that we didn't fight the geneticists, we, we you know, I'm very interested in the genetic aspects of this. You know, I was reading, um, what's the word, Sid Mukherjee's book, of Gene, you know, I was like trying to get my head around it all. <laughs> um, and I think they appreciated the fact that I was trying to understand their science and, and they are now trying, you know, whatever. Uh, Chelsea, I think we've got a question um, from Twitter. We do, yeah. So um, at jjagnor80 has asked, could I please have further insight on why hot and cold with realist approach? Why I'm going hot and cold with a realist approach? Um, I'll, I'll give you an example, actually, of... Um, so the realist approach is not what I've been talking about, but I did throw it in as a theory that I found unhelpful. Um, it's, I guess, a grand theory. The idea is you unpack everything into uh, context hyphen mechanism hyphen outcome configurations. Um, and so it says, well, we don't, we can't really put this in a very predictive way, but it, broadly speaking, if you've got this kind of context, this is the mechanism by which you might produce this outcome. And in other contexts, the mechanism plays out differently. So one of the things you have to do with realist um, evaluation is work out what is context, what is mechanism, and what is outcome. And we were looking at a bunch of data. We were doing realist reviews. So we were looking at empirical studies of community-based, um, what do they call it? Um, help me sort of action research stuff with communities, community-based participatory research. And what was the mechanism by which CBPR achieves 
positive outcomes. So um, one of the themes that was coming up in some of these papers was trust. You know, the, if, if you're researching and you're working with a community, you've all got to trust each other. Yeah, that's great, trust. So then we had a big thing. Some, in some realist papers, trust was a context. In some, it was a mechanism, and in some, it was an outcome. So we tied ourselves in enormous knots, and we managed to persuade ourselves that trust was um, an element of context and also an element of mechanism and also an element of outcome. And you think, hang on a minute, we are analytically deconstructing trust into these context mechanism outcome things, and then we're saying it's all of the above. <laughs> um, has that helped, or can we just say it's really important to build trust, and these are the ways you might build trust? Um, and I also find sometimes that the realist analysis deconstructs narratives and actually we could just go for the narratives um sometimes i wouldn't say it's always a bad idea i mean look i was the principal investigator on the ramesses standards for realist you know i'm just saying i think maybe sometimes it's a bit of a sledgehammer um and maybe just the story would be okay rebecca Thank you, Rebecca Ivers from the George Institute. I, I'm really interested in the next steps. You know, we've got this incredible stories and narrative that comes out. It's how how do you then take that and actually mm. put it into models and test them for effectiveness? Because of course, that's what we're all about is yeah. actually changing behaviour. How how do you do it? And how do you how do you unpack what is the most effective part of those the, the most important part of those stories to people? How it resonates with people. Well, I think you've got to be careful not to use a story as an intervention. Um, it's very tempting to look at the narrative as a text, as a thing. We'll feed people stories and that will change their behaviour. And actually, sometimes in, in public health, that sometimes works, actually. There's some very interesting randomised trials of giving the information as a story versus giving it as facts or whatever, you know, whatever. And, and, and the story stuff you know, seems to come out really well, but maybe that's because, maybe that's this publication bias, maybe if it went the other way, they wouldn't publish it, so I'm not, you know, whatever. But that's narrative as text, but actually I'm increasingly interested in narrative as verb, the process of storytelling, the who's in the room. Um, I do remember a few years ago with a, a Bangladeshi, a good Bangladeshi men, I didn't understand one word of what they were saying, so I was speaking in a dialect, uh, and my postdoc was, was a native uh, speaker of that dialect, and so I was just there really to kind of play the tape recorder and all that kind of thing. Um, but I do remember listening to things going on, and then one man who was dressed in a beautiful sort of um, Muslim kind of outfit with a white hat and the whole lot stood on the coffee table and took off his hat and folded it and held it. And there was this hushed silence and he told a story um, and sat back down. And then when we were analyzing the data, I said to Mimin Chowdhury, my, my co-researcher, I said, I really want the story where the guy stood on the coffee table and took his hat off. And I can't remember what it was now, but it was amazing. That was the story we had to listen to. Um, now, I, I, I give you that example in that the narrative is not just a text. The narrative is a performance. It's a drama. It has huge cultural significance. Um, even gossip. I mean, you know, there's interesting stuff around gossip. Why do we want to do it in the lift or in the toilet? I mean, you know, the, all that kind of thing. But in other words, story time, story place, audience, teller, genre are as important as the thing that is the story. So I think we've got to make sure we don't over-rationalise this. And in our Sharing Stories project, which has been going now for 20 years, we are as concerned with the venue and the overall kind of support for making it the right kind of place to tell particular stories as we are with actually capturing the stories. Do you see what I mean? Um, and I think that's that's a really important thing that maybe it's not we need to write stories or we need to grab some stories and, and give them to people. It's not like that. We need to promote the telling of stories and the sharing of stories. Um, 
It's terrific. I think we're running out of time. Do you want to make it a quick, quick question? I'm really interested in, in that idea of, of narrative as verb and that you've been through so many of these events. Do you get a sense um, of when, when the narrative is the the revealing of established meaning and when the narrative is the generation of new meaning in that process and context. Can you talk about oh, that yeah, at all? Absolutely. Um, and, and, and actually, I mean, we're almost in Paolo Freire now, Education for Critical Consciousness, but when you get a group of people telling stories, and like I say, the story is very often about an underdog, someone who in some way is disadvantaged, you get a critical consciousness. Um, and, I mean, years ago, when we started our um, diabetes story sharing groups, and I'll tell you, we did this because in 1998, we published a paper in the British Medical Journal all about Bangladeshi narratives of developing diabetes. Um, and actually, Moomin was using grounded theory, funnily enough. We kept deconstructing all these stories. We, had, we printed them out, and they were like this high. We had so many stories. Um, and it's worth telling this one. He was coding, micro-coding stuff, and, and he said, I'm coding whenever there's a change in behavior, and I'm coding what happens 20 lines above and below that. And so I said, well, what are you finding? He said, well, I'm often finding that people, people talk about, this is what doesn't change, behavior. they talk about something the health professionals said, something they were given, um, so they will have a leaf that they've kept in their breast pocket for 20 years about diet. It doesn't change their behavior. They value it, they respect it, but it doesn't change their behavior. So I said, well, all right, what does change their behavior? Go away and do the analysis. And he came back two weeks later to found out what changes behavior in this data set. Um, I said, what? He said, a story told by another Bangladeshi. Um, and interestingly, it wasn't the imam. It wasn't a leader. It wasn't one they thought. It was... Usually, I overheard it in the marketplace. It was gossip. So we thought, ah, oh, stories told by other Bangladeshis are what changes the behavior of Bangladeshis. So we set up these story sharing groups. We even did a randomized trial of it. It was called Poseidon. Um, lots of things we, we did. Um, but one of the things that happened in those story sharing groups was people were inspired to act. So, for example, in one group of fairly young women, I mean, I, I would think they'd be younger, like 30, um, although some of them were nearly grandmothers, <laughs> these are the compression of generations. Um, none of them wanted to go walking on their own, um, but as a result of coming to the story sharing groups, they set up a group, which is still going, called New and Striders, where they all go walking together and they tell their stories as they walk. So the idea that it's the story is this kind of instrument it's not at all it is about narrative as the verb uh, and that's really that's really important i think so thank you for inspiring great us. i think we've run out of time um fantastic trish thank you so much uh, for we've now had a few um interactions on your tour and looking forward to many more when you get back to oxford um so please join me in thanking trish greenhouse There might still be some food left over if you want to grab the crumbs on the way out.